Um, so, uh, I'm Magnus Hagender. I'm here to talk to you about the Postgres.org and how we do it. Um, so different from at least most of the previous speakers we've had, uh, this is from more the focus of just one project, not like you know, Apache, which is an umbrella for a lot of projects. Uh, Postgres.org is one project. Uh, I'm here myself, I'm a, a member of the Postgres core team and one of the committers, but probably the most important point from this perspective uh, is that I'm a member of the infrastructure team as well, which is a fairly small team that's charged with exactly running this infrastructure here. Uh, Postgres does not have employees at all. Um, as well, so when I'm not doing that, I work for a company called Red Pill Impro, uh, where I do consulting on, you know, Postgres <laughs> and other kinds of infrastructure things. And that's where you'll find most of the people who are working in the Postgres projects are one way or another uh, doing exactly that. So for those of you who don't know about Postgres, uh, Postgres is a relational, object relational database. Um, and someone mentioned, you know, Apache is conservative. Uh, we're a relational database that was founded in 1986. Yeah, we're conservative. <laughs> we may be more conservative than Apache. Uh, we'll try that. So uh, Postgres was started at Berkeley University in 1986. And it was actually, it, it's always been open sourced, but it was moved to become an external open source project outside of the control of Berkeley University um, in 1996. So it's still been around for a long time, uh, even outside of Berkeley. Uh, and it's a BSD style uh, licensed open source project, always has been. Uh, always a source of debate in some uh, cases, but uh, probably not from this uh, perspective. So Postgres is run, it doesn't have, unlike a lot of other organizations, it it's not actually run by an organization that is formal. So we don't have a foundation, we don't have a company in particular that runs it. It is run by an entity that we call the Postgres Global Development Group, which is not registered anywhere, which doesn't really exist. It's a completely virtual entity. Uh, that is basically made up of the people who happen to be contributing to Postgres at the time. Uh, this also means that we don't have copyright assignment or anything like that, so every individual who has contributed code to Postgres owns the copyright to that piece of code. Which, you know, that's what happens when you don't write it over to somebody else. It's all still licensed, obviously, under the Postgres license, so we're all fine to use it, but the contributors retain their individual copyrights. Uh, and it's a group that's, at least in theory, entirely consensus-based. Uh, we don't really have anyone who pulls the strings. Now, of course, there are some exceptions to this, but the important part is we don't have a single organization, a single company that decides what to do. Uh, what we have is something we call a core team. The Postgres model has originally been based on the BSD, like the FreeBSD and, and those guys, their models. So we do have a core team that basically oversees the project. Uh, what we like to say is their main mission is to do as little as possible. Arguably, sometimes we don't do enough. Uh, but that's the general idea. It's basically the core team has the deciding vote when we cannot reach consensus. The goal is still always to reach consensus uh, within what to do. They do have the final say. They do things like release scheduling because someone has to put the foot down and say, okay, now we have a date. That's really hard to do, <laughs> purely consensus-based. So that's when we tend to do that. Uh, and we make it a, an important part that we have a lot of different companies and a lot of different representatives on the core team. Uh, right now, if we look at the core team, we have six members representing five different companies all over the world. Uh, and the Postgres project takes a lot of pride in making sure that there is not a company or an organization anywhere that runs the project. It really is a completely open, both the code is open and the project is open uh, to control from a lot of different things. So from the perspective of infrastructure, basically the Postgres infrastructure, the way it looks, started really in 1996 as the project left Berkeley. A lot of the things that happened back in the Berkeley days, nobody really knows. It was run within a single department. It was not really documented. You know, rumor has it the code from that, those days are still around on tapes somewhere, either at Berkeley or UCSD, but we don't know. <laughs> the earliest bit of code that we have today with full revision history is when the project left Berkeley uh, in 1996 and moved to the, the fully open space. At which point, basically, the entire infrastructure that we had was one CVS server. We all loved CVS, right? That's what we used back then. It had a single major domo server for mailing lists with SendMail on it. Uh, they were both running in a single free BSD jail in a single data center, run by a single guy. That's all we had. And that's where we started. And it, I mean, for the time being, first of all, it's 1996. We had slightly different demands. 
Uh, it didn't take long for this, you know, not to be enough, obviously, so we had to move on. And it tended to grow, you know, as these things typically do, it grew organically. Someone said, well, you know, we probably need a website. Okay, let's add a website. Um, you know, we're going to need a wiki. Oh, let's add a wiki. Uh, we're going to need this, let's add that. And it ten ended up being, basically, we ha still had, I think we had at the point, like four uh, free BSD jails across two or three different servers that were all running a hodgepodge of different things. Uh, with still this one guy managing it, not really having the time to manage it. Uh, we had some really, really bad things happen. Uh, it, it tended to be unsustainable. We had, you know, the wiki basically, it wasn't hacked because it didn't really have the level of security that you needed to hack it before you posted uh, 140,000 pages on it. So we had someone post 140,000 pages to the wiki. Uh, we had things like that happen and we didn't really, like, it became obvious that this system really did not scale we had to do something about it. Uh, and it took a long time. We, we held out till about, I guess in theory, we held out till maybe 2007, 2008-ish. And then we went a little bit longer and then we realized, okay, now we really have to do something about this. We cannot keep going. So in the area of basically 2009, 2010, we redid how we do infrastructure by, you know, we tried to analyze the needs and really rebuild the whole thing. We threw everything out over a period of two years and replaced it completely. Now, as a matter of course, we didn't throw our data out, but we threw all the installations out. Uh, replaced all of it. We rebuilt it for maintainability. We rebuilt it for the fact that the world has changed since 1996. We really don't like CVS anymore. I don't know, sorry if those of you do. Maybe we are. So we say we're, we're conservative, but we're not that conservative. Uh, CVS is awesome for a certain very limited definition of awesome. <laughs> Uh, but it's basically, Postgres did hang on. At this point, we were still running CVS. Uh, we never went to Subversion, for example. We went directly from CVS to Git, which is a story in itself. That was one hell of a lot of work. Uh, and, of course, we reviewed our hosting options because this, having it in one single place, which at the point had also been moved to Panama for this guy's political reasons for other things that he was hosting, wasn't really sustainable either because every now and then, being a couple of times a week, we lost network connectivity and things like that. So we had to redo it all from scratch. Uh, the big challenges that I would look at, for example, we really needed to look at availability. We have people all over the world working at every part of the project. We really need 24 seven. We have committers in the US, in Europe, in Japan. We can't be down, obviously like most others. And we really took a hard look at sustainability. We have had providers, we've had other hosting providers through the years as well that suddenly just go away or change their business model uh, or, you know, go do something else. I was like, oh, sorry, guys. Um, yeah, you have a server with us. Yeah, we're going to remove it on Monday because we are evacuating this hosting space and we forgot about you. We've had these things happen. These are things we need to look for. So we really need to do that. And we also have vendors who used to be good who turned out to not be as good five years or ten years down the road. When you look at it through a, a period of 15 years, a lot of companies change. A lot of things change, whatever type of, of things they're doing. And of course, we also have a challenge of maintainability because we have a very limited set of resources, both when it comes to time and when it comes to money. Because basically, we can pay for zero time and zero money because we don't have a company, we don't have an organization. We did at one point, a long time ago, actually have ads on our website. We got rid of those pretty quickly because you know, people hate that particularly from projects like ours. Um, and they didn't bring in enough money to nearly cover anything anyway. Um, but if we look at the services, sort of when we go at it, what are the actual really important services that we need for, for Postgres? Uh, as mentioned, the same with Apache, we live and breathe on the mailing lists. We do have discussions elsewhere as well. We have IRC channels, we have whatnot. But just as with Apache, if the decision doesn't happen on the mailing list, it doesn't happen. If it happens anywhere else, then, well, that has to get reposted to the mailing list because that's where the actual uh, decision and things are happening. So really, the mailing lists are the most, most important resource. And this includes the mailing list archives. We have every single email on every single mailing list going back to 1997. We did lose about a year in the beginning in a disk crash where, you know, hosting provider didn't have the backups that they said they had. But we do have every single email going back there. It's well over a million emails you know, fully indexed, easily browsable. And you will find, if you go look at the discussions today, people will bring up emails from 1998, referencing them, saying, hey, we've talked about this before. Here's what we came up to then. You know, maybe it's not relevant anymore, but we have talked about this before. So it's a very, very important 
resource. Then, of course, the website and downloads area is also important because we want to somehow get our data out to the users. We don't want to just stay in CERN. Uh, we have a Git repository, obviously the repository itself, but also maintaining access to it, uh, maintaining the security and the integrity of the Git repository is very important. Uh, we don't want bad things. Luckily, Git helps us a lot along the line there. It's a lot easier to maintain integrity in your repository with Git than it was with CVS. Uh, but, you know, we all have it. Uh, we have a wiki, very important. Uh, we have our release build nodes that guarantees that when we build our releases, they actually look exactly the same as last time. Uh, again, something that we back in the days had a problem with because we went to build the new minor release and suddenly the same version of the build tools weren't there anymore because someone had upgraded the virtual machine that we're running on. We were like, okay, so it still worked, but it wasn't, it, it, we introduced other changes that we really should not have done. Did I get that in time? No, I did not. Could you please log in again? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> uh, so these are all really the, the core services. Now we have a bunch of other services, but these are the things that are really important. And of course, maintaining security across this, uh, which is really something that we had a problem with the ad hoc method before, because we had random people, that, like, there, was, there was no central documentation of who had access to which machines. That's a pretty big failure from a security perspective. So these were all things that we needed to fix. We have a bunch of other things. We have regional systems. We even have events management systems dealing, you know, for our conferences and things, including full payment processing and all that stuff. We have that. We have IRC bots, we have a build farm, we have all sorts of things that we also run. So the way we're doing it right now is basically someone once told it, well, guys, you just built the cloud. Uh, that's basically what we're doing. We're, it's 100% it's VMs. We're doing everything in virtual machines. We're doing 100% Debian, uh, because that makes it a lot easier when you're monoculture makes it much easier to maintain. And basically we deploy one VM per service because that makes it easier to control. None of this hodgepodge of a lot of different things. And we build everything we do with a very strong reliance on Debian. Uh, that makes it much easier for us because we know that everything that's running is Debian. So we have a, a strong base plate. We know that if we pick services that happens to be packaged up properly in Debian that are maintained by Debian, then we don't need to bother we know that Debian will take care of security patching for us, for example. If we're running the Apache web server or something like that, we know that when there is a security release coming out, Debian's going to wrap it up for us. We don't need to m manage this individually, and we're going to get it across all the boxes at once. It's actually almost true. It's, it's like 98% uh, Debian, because you know, for we have a box that does the monitoring of everything else that's actually running a CentOS, you know, just because it should be different. It's also running in a completely different hosting provider from everything else. So monitoring everything from the outside so we don't run the risk of accidentally you know, triggering, making things look right in our monitoring when they're not for everybody else. And the focus is entirely on essential services. We, tried, we, we serve up other things as well, but we try to be down there. And basically what the solution comes down to, we got about 2,000 lines of code to maintain our infrastructure. So we don't run tools like Puppet or Chef. Instead, we replace that with approximately 2,000 lines of code that does exactly what we want and nothing more which makes it very easy to maintain for us. There is uh, a backend that runs Django with just some basic views. Unsurprisingly, there's a little bit of Postgres there uh, where we store data about our nodes. Uh, but in the end, it's as thin a layer as possible to make it easy to run. Now, the size of this, our infrastructure is fairly small. I, I just looked this up yesterday. We have 11 servers in total. Uh, they're all sponsored in the way that someone gave us the server. Uh, we haven't paid for anything, but we only have dedicated servers. Uh, we, don't, we have offers every now and then, you know, we'll get you a couple of virtual machines, and we just say, no, thank you. We want the whole thing so we can run our platform on it. Uh, they're distributed. We have data centers on the U.S. East Coast. Uh, we have in Texas, we have in Austria, we have in Sweden, we have in the Netherlands, and we have in Germany. So we, have, we don't have over in Asia. We've had offers there, actually, but we, right now we have more capacity than we need. Uh, they're spread across six different data centers. Again, all sponsored. We don't pay for bandwidth anywhere. Someone else does. Uh, a lot of these sponsors are actually sponsored by ISPs, so they don't pay for bandwidth either. And you know, compared if you're a tier one or tier two ISP, the amount of bandwidth that we push, which you know, on a release day goes up to a couple of hundred megabits, it's nothing to them. It doesn't really cost them anything. We have a small team that runs it. We're, the infrastructure team is five people with an exactly dedicated time of zero hours per day or month or year. It's entirely run on a volunteer basis. 
Uh, we do have the team spread out again across Sweden, which is me, then Austria, UK, East Coast and West Coast in the US and Chile. So we basically have somebody up 24-7. Now they're not dedicated, but they're all in there. So yes, if like a major security issue is found or something like that, then somebody will be on it really quickly to take care of it. No, we don't pay them to do that. We can't force them to do that. But they're volunteers and they're all relying on Postgres in their business. So they all have you know, a self-interest in actually making sure that these things are properly taken care of. Uh, one important thing that we've done in this is that we have excluded doing the Forge style hosting. We used to do this. It was a lot of work, in particular since uh, we were using GForge and we were using GeForce on, GeForge on an unsupported platform, which was extra much fun. So we had someone who did work on it to adapt it to run on FreeBSD at the time. And then that guy left the project. And yeah, uh, it really didn't work very well. And it's a huge support burden. It's a slow speed of updating. We fell behind the curve and people didn't like the service. So find it's more important to actually host things that we can do well and then have somebody else deal with those. We still do pure Git hosting for uh, community projects as well that are not the main project, but we focus it on the projects that are big and important in the community. For example, we host the PG Admin project, which is formally not a part of Postgres, but we host a website for them, we host the Jenkins for them, we host their Git repository. We host the Git repository for some of the external replication engines because they now have a trustworthy sort of upstream. But for general projects, we still tend to say, you know, you can go, go use GitHub. We'll be happy to, you know, have a mirror of your code repository to make sure that it's protected. If you are a major project in the community, we will eventually probably absorb you in and put you on the sort of main infrastructure, but we don't put everybody in there because we want to make sure that we focus on the things that we do so that we can do them well. Uh, So in a short summary, we do have a self-hosted, entirely self-hosted for the main project. Uh, we have a high, but we don't actually define our SLAs. In so far that, at least so far this year, we've certainly had significantly less downtime than GitHub. Um, we have a strong focus on the core services, and we have a strong focus on trying to be vendor and sponsor independent. Because having been around since 96 in doing this, we have seen both vendors and sponsors come and go and the troubles that you run into when they do. Or, you know, when they do funny things like start injecting ads in your emails, which, you know, <laughs> hello, SourceForge. Yeah. You know, it was fine until they did that, but that's sort of the thing. And if you look at the hosting things today, none of them actually supply mailing lists except for SourceForge, which supplies mailing lists with ads in them. We don't want that. That's something that we're willing to pay the volunteer time to get away from. But when source first started, nobody knew that. A lot of things happens over time. Nobody knows what's going to happen with GitHub later. GitHub is pretty awesome right now in a lot of ways, except they don't support mailing lists. Uh, but, yeah, well, yeah, for a limited definition of awesome, but they do a lot of things well. But we don't know where they're going to be. We push a mirror to GitHub so that people who like to browse through GitHub, they can browse through GitHub. I think we actually still push a mirror to SourceForge. You know, if somebody actually manages to get through the interface and find the code there, you know, it's there. <laughs> Uh, we push a mirror to Bitbucket. Like, we have no problem with that, but the primary resource is on community infrastructure. Uh, well, yeah, that's basically yeah, it. Most of the time that SourceForge was up, it was running on a single Postgres database. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then you moved to DB2. What's that? Then they no, moved they to DB2. And then they moved back. Yeah, didn't no, they, they temporarily moved to DB2? Never even temporarily moved to DB2. Oh, there was talk of doing it. Uh, it Maybe that was IBM marketing. Okay. Yeah. I know they came back to Postgres at least, <laughs> even in mindset yeah, as well. They were on Postgres the whole time. Yeah. The only thing that wasn't on Postgres was the auto block system and Project Web, which was on MySQL. Yeah. But it was never on DB2. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the reason, again, having been around for a long time, the reason that we go with self hosting today is basically we've seen what happens and what can happen, you know, 10 years down the road. If we don't know. It does take effort. It's certainly a lot easier to just stick everything up on a, on a hosting site, but you don't know what's going to happen. Now, Git has, a, has solved this problem in a way for the code. Right? We, I, did the, I was the primary guy who did the migration from CVS to Git for Postgres. That was not a funny job. That took a long time, like a year. Because you know, we're conservative, we wanted to make sure that every single revision all the way back to 1996 was correct. We found a lot of interesting corruption in the CVS repository, by the way, <laughs> that we had to fix before we could do the migration. And we found that every single migration tool had bugs in them. 
but at least one of the migration tool people would work with us to fix the bugs. Uh, but Git does allow us now to do the full clone. So you actually, you have every history, even if GitHub were to die tomorrow, all the code that's on there is protected by the, the nature of Git. But the websites and the issue trackers and all those things are not necessarily protected by the nature of Git. But the code itself, which is our most precious resource, certainly is. Uh, and again, we've tried the rehosting. Uh, it's much easier if you don't care about your data. And again, with the CVS repo, we did have the thing. We, most of the people we talked to said, well, just import the branch tip of every branch and you're fine. I'm like, no, we use the history back to 1996. Maybe not every day, but certainly every week. People look at that. People use it. And being able to build something with service transferability that we can easily move this between different places is vital, I think, when you're self-hosting. Otherwise, you can end up, if one of our providers go away tomorrow, we'll lose, lose services for two days. Then we'll have them up and running at a different place. And limiting the scope, because we don't have unlimited manpower. It would be awesome to have that, but you know, we don't. OK, I'm well over time, I think. <laughs> so uh, are we, is, we're going into a break, I think. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. What's the relation with the, such a company like Enterprise B uh, uh, referring to integrity and reliability of the code? So, uh, at Enterprise DB is one of many companies that work uh, with Postgres in more or less the same way. Uh, now, Enterprise DB has a proprietary product that's built on Postgres, and they have a services business that's built on Postgres. Most companies uh, that are using Postgres have a services business that's built on Postgres and no proprietary. But Amazon has a proprietary product in RDS that's built on Postgres. Um, Astro Data, Teradata has a product proprietary built on Postgres. Now, m uh, a lot of these companies help contribute code to upstream Postgres, whether they're Enterprise DB, whether they're you know, my company, Red Pill Impro, whether they're a second quadrant, whether they're Teradata, they contribute code back up. But they all do so on you know, equal terms. So Enterprise DB holds no special uh, standing in the Postgres community. They have a lot of resources. They have more full-time developers than my company, for example. But, not, but some of them work on the proprietary, and some of them work on the open one. But they are a contributor amongst others. Uh, they certainly do a good job, along with many other players. Uh, and that's something that I, I like about how we've made the work in the Postgres project, is we've actually got all these vendors who all work together uh, towards the upstream. And then, of course, companies like Enterprise DB then take it down and build the next version of their proprietary on top of that. Uh, but they participate in the community, which is the important part. Yeah, I think you might have a question, but a quick, quick one and a quick answer. Well, yes. Uh, maybe can you can at this point that, I mean, why didn't you thought about bringing your project to some organization like Apache, for instance, where <laughs> you have everything you wanted, including, you know, uh, your own space to do what you want. But you wouldn't let us use CVS. We had CVS for years. <laughs> yeah, we had CVS longer than you did. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> no, I think the moving to a foundation would have been the only other possible thing. Now, moving to something like the Apache Foundation comes with a bunch of other rules. It would certainly have been much better than moving to a single proprietary hosting. But given that we had the resources to do the self-hosting, uh, everybody felt that was definitely the better idea. Okay, great example. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magnus. Thank you.